do a quick introduction. Um, so we are the backend engineering team for a cybersecurity company called Bluevoyant. My name is Alfredo. Um, and we're a company that's a mid-level startup, well, actually getting larger now, but uh, for about four or five years. And uh, yeah. Oh, Sam. All right. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so we're a cybersecurity company, um, and we're the backend engineering team for a particular product called Third Party Risks. So I'll go into that, and then we'll go into the whole data pipeline and how we use Beam. So, what is third party risk? Um, well, there's always a relevant XKCD. So, this is, uh, this is an illustration of modern digital infrastructure and how everything is pretty much built on top of building blocks, of building blocks, of building blocks. And uh, you might have all of your infrastructure actually leveraging on one tiny building block that is a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. Um, so, when we look at first party risk, we're talking about um, when you're looking at your server, the thing that you deployed, how do you protect that? How do you put firewalls around that? Um, third party risk, we're looking at the little block. Uh, so a hacker is actually more, uh, probably gonna have a better chance attacking the smaller blocks in your third party dependencies that you use than attacking your main servers that you've probably invested a whole bunch of money into protecting. So this is a typical organization. We can see a whole bunch of different branches that might have other parts uh, within those, so logistics, R&D, legal, might be different departments that are maybe outsourced, uh, maybe uh, in different companies altogether, um, but they might be sharing attack vectors. So uh, employees with shared credentials, uh, they might have connection to networks or any other kind of way that, uh, that someone could go in through uh, one of these smaller companies into your large organization. So what do we do? Well, uh, we have a bunch of smart people, a bunch of analysts that come from uh, a lot of different cybersecurity backgrounds uh, that are using our sophisticated backend to be able to look at all of these different components, uh, the third party uh, vendors behind your company uh, pretty much 24 seven. Uh, so in an example, um, we might see that a vendor within a company has some remote office that didn't patch some VPN update. And so there's a vulnerability and there's remote access exposed. Uh, so we'll actually work with the vendor that has the vulnerability and we'll close the ticket, we'll close the port um, and remediate the problem. So we're not just looking at these things and reporting them out, we're actually patching and fixing all of your third party dependencies actively. So why is this a big data problem? Well, there's a, there's a whole lot of data as you can imagine. We're looking at pretty much as much data as we can that a hacker might have insight to. Anything publicly internet facing data a lot of this is constantly streaming. Uh, a lot of this is batch. We're getting dumps from different data sources. Um, and all of this, of course, is coming in different formats, different semantics, uh, different deliveries. And we have to deal with all these kinds of problems that happen when unifying all these different data sources. We also have um, the problem of how do we associate this data with the assets, the servers, the domains, the IPs that are attached to third parties. And third parties are going to be growing, changing. Uh, their footprints are going to be evolving. They might be using cloud hosting assets. They might be sharing assets with other vendors. And so we have a whole bunch of different targets that we're looking at that might be associated with different parts of, uh, of the internet. Uh, and also the, the threat landscape that we're looking at changes every second. So new exploits are being found constantly, new zero days. I'm sure everyone here has seen a lot of the RSS feeds of you know log4j, log4shell coming out in December and ruining everyone's holidays. Uh, now everyone has to go out, they have to patch things, they have to fix things, uh, and it's just constantly happening. So it's a very dynamic threat landscape uh, and a very dynamic set of targets to look at. Another way to look at this uh, is basically we're a big funnel. Uh, so we're taking a whole bunch of data up to 11 million records per second, and we're filtering that down to the relevant maybe four pieces of data that are going to be really critical findings that are showing, you know, you have a, a single port open on a single server, so we really cannot tolerate data loss at all. So solution, we developed this, this backend that's, that we call Profit. Uh, not to be confused with Facebook's Profit that we learned about this morning. Uh, it's an unfortunate name, but uh, the basic idea of this, so this is the, the Star Trek onboard computer, if you might recognize it from Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, and the whole idea with this is 
you parse all of the information that you know into the, the kind of highest level semantics you can without deriving new information on top of it. You don't make assumptions about the data because all of this might be wrong tomorrow. New exploits might come out tomorrow. Uh, new footprints might change tomorrow. So all we know is what was observed. Why do we use Beam? So why don't we use, you know, insert your favorite data warehouse or data lake solution? Uh, well, uh, first of all, like I said, we have batch and stream data sources. Turns out that's exactly what Beam is for. Uh, it lets us unify everything into a single code base. Uh, and I'll go into why that's really useful for us uh, in, in just a second. Um, and it also allows us to do real code and real workflows per element, because we're not just doing filtering, aggregation, counting. We're actually triggering workflows because we want to know, you know, not just what was open, but we have to do now validation, uh, check the open port, and communicate that out to, to service uh, people and actually uh, operate on that data. So this also uh, allows us to add a high throughput to what might otherwise be a low throughput but low latency backend because we can basically issue tons of little tiny queries from tons of workers and turn us into a high throughput machine. And we'll go into that uh, a whole bunch more uh, in the rest of the talk. So uh, yeah, and then lastly, um, we really like that we can really manage business logic in Beam. Um, we don't have to deal with a lot of tuning parameters the way that you do with Spark uh, or Hadoop. Um, so yeah, Beam plus Google Dataflow has been really great. All right, so first off, uh, Beam lets us, because we can do everything sort of in terms of code and transform all of our disparate data sources into common objects, it actually serves as a data modeling layer and a data integration layer. Uh, so we're, we're pushing data, we're pulling data, we're collecting data in other ways. Um, and if we unify all of these into a common object, uh, we created this, this idea of a cyber datum, then we can do things like semantic validation, schema validation, quality control on ingest, uh, we can trigger different workflows, uh, do, uh, do API requests, uh, pretty much anything that you'd want to do in a workflow environment, we can now do that while we're integrating and modeling the data on ingest. And then when we pull it back out, we have the same uh, object uh, semantics, and we can use those in the exact same ways. After getting everything in, uh, we then uh, have a daily, um, a daily job that does all of the analytics to produce, uh, well, to run this whole funnel of data and to figure out what is the what are the pieces of interest. So um, we pull data for the latest footprints, meaning what are the assets of interest, the IPs, the domains of interest within all the third-party companies, apply the latest analytics, so what does the current threat landscape look like, what are the vulnerabilities we care about, and then we turn those into all of these elements, uh, which are really just uh, identifiers of risk. So an example here, some healthcare company might be outsourcing their data management to some other company. They might be storing all of their really sensitive uh, HIPAA data uh, in a bucket, and it might be publicly readable. So we'll be able to see that. We'll work with the data management company. We'll close it down, and we'll alert the healthcare company of the situation. So yeah, like I said, it's like having a billion human analysts running daily queries, all in parallel, and doing analysis, uh, doing this whole kind of um, parallel workflows. And we'll go into a whole bunch more of what that actually does. So zooming out again, this is our whole pipeline. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll let the team go into the, the nitty gritty of um, these particular beam challenges. And to start with, um, Tucker is going to talk about how we ingest an index up to 11 million records per second. Thank you, Alfredo. That's pretty hot. Um, yeah, so step one is after we've gotten our data from the various uh, our various data sources, we need to get it into a common database where we can query it in all the ways we need to query it. Uh, so uh, yeah, again, this is kind of step one uh, after we parse everything into the common data model that Alfredo was talking about. So most of our data sources uh, kind of work more or less out of the box with uh, Dataflow and Bigtable, which are uh, the, the runner and the database we use respectively for most of our jobs. Uh, this is mostly because most of our data sets are of a manageable size for these big data technologies. Uh, they also are mostly batch jobs, which are a little bit simpler and easier to manage. Uh, and they also only require a single index, which means that you can essentially have a one-to-one -one map between the actual records and the big table rows you need. So you only have to write the data once. Uh, however, we do have this one data set which is a little bit different and requires some special care for a uh, few reasons. 
um, primarily is that it's just really high volume. Um, we get up to 11 million records per second. The records are usually hundreds of kilobytes. So this is you know, talking about terabytes of data every second that we need to get into our database in a way that we can query it. Uh, it's also a continuous stream, which means we have uh, very hard um, kind of latency requirements. Like we need to be able to keep up with the stream. Otherwise, we'll just be, you know, hopeless. We'll fall behind hopelessly. Um, and uh, we also need to index this data in multiple ways for a given record. So each record has multiple fields that we need to be able to query. Um, and if we were to just naively uh, write multiple big table rows for each record duplicating the data, we kind of multiply the whole data volume problem. Um, and while big table can support this, it would be very expensive. It'd be unnecessarily expensive, something like hundreds of thousands of dollars a month for this one data source. Um, and we can do better. Uh, one, so the, what you typically do when you're trying to optimize a pipeline is focus on the bottleneck. Uh, in this case, the bottleneck is the big table key or the row creation. If you're not familiar with big table, you can kind of think about it as like a really big uh, sorted key value list. So the expensive operation is usually inserting a new row into that list because you got to move things around and split tablets and so on. Um, so if we can reduce the number of keys or rows we have to create in big table, we can improve the performance of our pipeline uh, and the cost. So a simple way to do this is to uh, group records that share some properties that we want to key on into single rows. Uh, so in this case, you have two records here that happen to have the same uh, write timestamp that we use in the key. So if you can combine them into a single row that has both the records, you can write your keys. Um, and this is great. It improves the big table write throughput quite a lot. Um, but it creates another problem, which is that now you need to group all of your records into these common keys. Um, and now you have this big shuffle operation, which takes a lot of time. So we've kind of moved the, the excessive cost from big table into data flow now. Um, so it's still too expensive. And you can still do better. Um, so it's often said any problem in computer science can be solved with another level of indirection. This is often attributed to David Wheeler of the Burroughs Wheeler Transform. And it's true in this case as well. Um, so the basic idea is that we can have kind of a composite database where we have a uh, high throughput uh, data store, which stores like, so in this case, we use GCS, which is good for a uh, fewer number of keys, larger files, uh, higher throughput, lower latency access, and that's where the actual data lives. Um, and then the we store indexes uh, that point to each of those files, which actually contains the records in Bigtable, which can give us lower latency access and the multiple uh, sort of indexes we need for each individual record. So if you have a composite database, you need a composite ingest system. This is uh, kind of a high level what it looks like. Um, so we get the data coming in. And we have a Spark streaming job that essentially groups and prepares the, the uh, Avro files. Um, we tried to use Beam for this, but uh, Spark let us uh, gave us more control over the bundle sizes. And particularly, this needs to be a streaming job to keep up with our data stream. Um, so we, you know, we really tried to use Beam, wanted to get it to work. Uh, but Spark just ended up giving us better performance. So this is something we'd like to see changing going forward um, so we can use Beam everywhere. Um, but once we have our data on GCS, we have a series of data flow batch jobs that read an hour at a time and generate the indexes and then write them to Bigtable. Um, and we're still doing this, that sort of grouping operation I talked about before. Um, and we actually had another uh, optimization um, for this particular use case that lets us reduce the amount of data we're shuffling as well. So I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so the trade-off, of course, is now you have this sort of two-layer database. Um, so if you want to read any data, you've got to make issue two queries. Um, so your latency is going to go up and, and so on. Uh, and for this particular use case, this is an acceptable trade-off because since the data is it's, it's like just really a huge data stream, turns out that most of the data you write, you'll never actually read. Um, so sacrificing read performance, write performance turns out to make sense in this case. Um, there's also certain cases where just the indexes are enough. You don't actually need to get the whole record, um, in which case it's just like querying big table normally. Uh, OK, so let's talk about that uh, shuffle optimization I mentioned a little bit before. Um, so again, the idea is we want to group records that have uh, the same keys or at least similar keys into single rows so we can write them at once. Um, and the kind of standard way to do this in Beam is with a group by key operation, which induces a shuffle. And as many of you know, that's typically the bottleneck in most MapReduce style uh, operations. And it's it, it's the bottleneck because you have to do all this network communication and sort of all, all communication between all the workers. Um, now, if you don't actually need 
uh, sort of full grouping, as in like you don't care if um, worker one doesn't get all of the A's in this example, you're just fine if it has a few of the A's, which is in our case, you can actually just forego uh, the network step and essentially do a local group by, which you call it, which is doing the shuffle operation, but uh, kind of each worker does it with just the records it happen to has, happens to have on hand. Um, and this is fine for our case since it just, we don't actually care about getting all of the rows with a particular key property into one key. We just want some grouping so we don't have to create as many big table rows. Um, now, uh, how do you do this? Beam has a nice group by key API, uh, but it doesn't have this sort of local group by key API. So we have to build it ourselves. Um, the simplest way to do this, this is the Java uh, SDK if you're familiar with it. Uh, is just to have each do fund have a local hash map as you're, you know, you put your records in your map for each bundle, then you output the map at the end of your bundle. Um, this is fine, but the prop, the main problem it has is that uh, you only have one group per bundle and per do fund thread. Um, so it doesn't actually give you that uh, much grouping because you're kind of splitting your data too, too much. Uh, a simple way to improve this is to just repeat it a few times. Um, so this way you kind of group across bundles and across worker threads. Um, and we end up doing something like this in our jobs. Um, you could do even better. However, uh, this sort of setup still kind of um, keeps each of the worker threads independent. Um, so you could instead do something like this, where now instead of just a hash map, we have a concurrent hash map and it's a global variable. So all the worker threads are sharing it. This is a little dangerous though, because uh, now you have shared state between all your do funds. Uh, and you don't actually manage the creation of those do funds threads. That's something that the runner does for you. Um, so you are potentially wandering into dangerous concurrent code land, which is you know part of the, one of the selling points of Beam is that it manages the parallelism for you, so you don't have to worry about stuff like this. But you can do this if you want to. Um, so, uh, so that's a bit about how we ingest the data. Um, now, once we have it in the database, uh, my coworker Adam will tell you more about how we actually get it out and do things with it. Thanks, Tucker. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Adam Naiman. Uh, let's see, is this thing on? Yeah, OK, great. Um, my name's Adam Naiman. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer. I've been at Bluevoyant for about four years now working on Beam. Uh, prior to that, I was at Google for some time working on Beam. And prior to that, I was at FIS working on uh, Dataflow before it even was Beam. So if there's anybody in the audience who's contributed to or helped the development of Dataflow and Beam go on, I just want to shout out, shout you guys out um, because it's uh, it's been a wild ride and it's been a big part of my career. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about um, what it is we're doing here. So we've got all this data inside a big table and uh, we need to get it out. Um, how are we gonna do that? Well, we built uh, you know, in our zoo of pipelines, we put together something that we like to call the search pipeline. Um, what it does is it effectively takes in arbitrary queries, <laughs> figures out how to get that data and pull it back out. Um, but we have a, a problem. We've got a lot of queries, billions in fact. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I assume if we're at a Beam conference, we're all familiar with Amdahl's law. Yes, no? Uh, if you're not, um, it's a way to measure uh, when you're tuning the performance of a pipeline, what parts you should focus on. And um, the Beam model really lends itself to this because you know, in a perfect world, you could have one core per record and uh, your pipeline would be as fast as possible. Uh, unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world, so we have to sort of um, you know, uh, defer to this and figure out what to optimize first, when, where, and how. And uh, I'd like to talk about how Beam um, helps us achieve those goals. OK, so what are we feeding this search pipeline? Um, well, what we're doing is uh, the input is effectively a footprint. A footprint is a collection of ciders. Um, a cider is a notation for representing a group of IP addresses. Um, if you haven't seen this before, uh, an example here at the top is 8.8.8.8 uh, slash 32 represents a singular IP address of 8888. Um, and 1.2.3.4 uh, slash 16 written in, represents a whole litany of IP addresses all the way from 1.2.0.0 down, down, down to 1.2.255.255, uh, right? So there's an inverse relationship here. If you're at uh, 32, uh, that's just one. Um, you can go all the way down to slash one, which is you know, an enormous amount of ranges. Um, we have a, a, a couple of handfuls of uh, slash 16s and slash 8s in our pipeline. Um, if you think about this, this is effectively uh, compressed input, right? Um, small, small input can blow up to something enormous. 
And um, what we found when we ran this naively is we have this sort of long tail effect where if we get a slash eight or slash 16, we'll have one core sort of churning away, going, 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 producing um, up to billions of objects. And this was um, a problem for us. So we realized that we, you know, we, we had a bunch of cores sitting around doing nothing. And uh, we wanted to figure out how we could, uh, you know, get them to sort of earn their keep. So um, we realized that you can um, break apart each cider into various blocks and distribute those out using um, uh, shuffle to uh, allow, allow those other subsequent workers to um, continue to create those objects. So we do this at um, slash 8, slash 16, slash 32s. And um, it has this nice effect that everybody's busy at the same time. Um, and you don't have any one worker uh, generating a long tail of objects. So we were able to amortize that, that cost and distribute that across our entire cluster. Um, furthermore, we need to convolute uh, with respect to time when we issue these queries. Um, so things can get pretty hairy. And uh, I'd like to talk to you about that in the next slide. Um, so uh, after we've done, uh, after we're done decompressing all of our queries, how many do we have? Turns out we have uh, 6.3 billion queries, and we need to execute all of this, them. So um, that's a lot, and uh, you know we decided to just sort of take a naive stab at this and see what happens. Um, and when we did that, we this translated out to roughly you know over 2,000 cores, took four to six hours of runtime. And um, one of the problems with issuing this many queries is that you know you get a lot of retries, uh, things don't go through the network. Some um, some of these queries execu uh, return a lot of data, which cause out of memory on um, the workers that download them. And then other queries are completely vacuous, right? There's, there's no data to be retrieved. And at this scale, uh, you know, sending out all of these queries and having workers wait for their response, it, it sort of adds up in terms of processing time. And you know, uh, when you're renting a core, uh, you know, that's uh, dollars and cents, right? Uh, so let's talk about how we uh, overcame some of these challenges. Um, so the pseudomon, you may realize that um, you know, 6.3 billion IP addresses is a little too many, right? There's only, uh, you know, two to the 32 minus one IPv4 addresses. And of those, roughly 3.7 billion are publicly addressable. Um, so something's going on, right? Maybe it's the pigeonhole principle. Um, so the group I keep uh, confirms this, but it's still a lot. So, you know, we, we've managed to cut this in half, um, but it doesn't really uh, solve the problem of out of memories, retries, vacuous course. So let's see if we can figure out how to um, draw a box around those and, and tackle those. Um, so uh, just, just to restate it, you know, a vacuous query is like, hey, do you have any data about this IP address? What can you tell me about it, right? And uh, the answer is nope. Um, unfortunately, it's still last time. Um, out of memories are like the complete opposite problem, right? You issue a query and like you blow the poor worker away because it just doesn't have enough RAM to, uh, to uh, do what it needs to do, right? So um, how, can we, how can we solve this? Well, uh, just like every superhero has a good sidekick, uh, we invented the secondary index for... Um, for uh, our, our profit system. So what this does, the secondary index is basically a database that, solves, that stores just a small subset of the data that we're processing profit, right? It's just fact of stuff, right? Um, what are you, do you exist, and when, and, and when did you exist, right? When do we observe this phenomenon? And uh, initially, we were storing this in Bigtable. We found out that uh, BigQuery was a better choice. It's more performant for these sorts of uh, SQL queries that you see on the slide next to me. Um, and it has this nice side effect of, uh, you know, analysts get to play with it and answer a lot of questions about the data before they um, bother to uh, issue a query through profit itself. Um, you know, I'd like to shout out uh, the design philosophy for Beam of having like a DAG because uh, if you need, if you find that you need to build out your system in another orthogonal direction that wasn't obvious at first, you could just tack on um, those operations at the point where you have a handle on that P collection. That was, um, it was a uh, very easy to do. So uh, thank you for whoever came up with that idea. Um, okay, so uh, so. Let's talk about um, what do we do with the data once we've downloaded from the secondary index, right? So um, it's still a lot of data, right? Uh, and what we'd like to do is, is prevent, you know, group by keys and shuffle where possible because those happen to be bottlenecks in pipelines. Um, so we settled on a bitmap um, to broadcast to all of our workers uh, in order to do an in-memory filter, right? And, and this has some really nice properties because um, if you think about IP addresses, they're just numbers, right? Natural numbers. Um, and bitmap seems like a natural fit. Uh, you know, a, a naive implementation um, was, takes about 536 megabytes that we broadcast to all the workers. Um, we did a little research. We scratched our heads. We found something called a roaring bitmap, which is kind of like a compressed bitmap. Um, so that cut down on um, some of the, the network time that we, we had to wait for workers to download the data. And um, this was actually like a natural fit for uh, combined FNs because, you know, if you're ordering a bunch of bitmaps together, the data, the, the size is never really um, changing. And it's, uh, you know, the, the operations are associative and commutative. So um, it, it uh, was the way to go on this. Um, so once we've um, broadcast all of these bitmaps to our workers to do an in-memory filter, we find that we've been able to reduce our queries from um, 6.3 billion to 1.5 billion. And that's before doing any um, group by key or deduplication. Um, OK, so that solves uh, the existential question. But what about the uh, queries that um, were resulting in out of memories? 
Um, so in order to do that, you know, if you take a step back, you realize, well, hey, wait a minute. Not only do I have the fact that an IP exists, um, but uh, I know how many times I've seen it observed. And this should um, <clears throat> this this translates to basically how many records we're going to download from um, our profit database itself, right? So if we assume a uniform distribution of an IP over a time range, which we generally observe at this scale, um, we can partition or split the key space into a range accordingly, right? So uh, the example here is a little contrived and it isn't something that we um, do in practice, but just to walk you through it, if you can imagine you have an IP of 1.2.3.4 and you wanna say, give me um, all of the data that you have in the month of April, um, the uh, secondary index would tell us that we have 30 records. And if you can imagine that a record is sufficiently large or your worker is sufficiently small, that storing more than one at any given time would cause an out-of-memory error. You can um, split up or um, associate uh, resources in such a way that you now have 30 queries um, that execute uh, over you know, one per day and should assume to download roughly one record at a time. Um, okay, so uh, We've been sympathetic to whether something exists. We've been sympathetic to whether or not it has a lot amount, a large amount of data. But um, can we be sympathetic to the storage layer? And it turns out that we can. Um, Bigtable has an API call called Sample Row Keys that will tell you how the data is distributed amongst the underlying tablets. And um, this is basically the same uh, process as before, but we would just repeat it, um, understanding where the tablets are split so that we know not to hit any one tablet too hard. So uh, when all is said and done, um, we started with 6.3 billion. We uh, filtered down to 1.5. And then after um, uh, deduplicating and group and keying, we're left with roughly 450 million scans, which is still a lot, but it's certainly something that we can grapple with, right? Okay, so uh, now we've got to run these things. Um, in order to do that, we batch uh, 450 million scans into collections of 256 each, which basically ensures that no one worker will receive uh, more than uh, too many scans, right? You, you don't want something to be running for too long. Uh, this translates to roughly 1.8 million, 1 million scan groups, right? Um, something that we utilized to great effect was uh, checkpointing, right? Um, you know, we've, we've noticed that some, some scans would fail partway through, uh, either from uh, connection errors or there would be a subsequent transformation that was expensive and caused an out-of-memory error. And so um, we've realized that if we sort of checkpoint our uh, our queries before we ran the scan and we uh, by, by reshuffling, and if we um, checkpoint small subsets of our data set that would eventually trickle down into expensive operations before we committed or ran those operations, um, it would uh, generally help pipelines succeed where they otherwise would have failed. So I highly recommend doing that um, if you have the opportunity to utilize it. Um, okay, so uh, multi-threading. So the B model says you don't have to multi-thread, right? Just write your code in a single-threaded function and it'll sort of take care of it for you. Um, but we've been able to utilize it to some great success. I would say don't don't shy away from it. Um, one philosophy we adopt as we think of DoFunds is like entirely separate microservices and the Beam framework will just sort of handle the the nasty parts of Kubernetes where you have to think of like stateful sets and networking and message passing um, and sort of the right thing happens. So um, don't shy away from this. Uh, I highly recommend looking into it. If you want some examples, I can't recommend Spotify style library well enough. Uh, if you, you may need to speak Scala in order to understand it, but if you don't, it's an excellent reason to learn. Um, the one thing I can't help you with is benchmarking. Unfortunately, that does take a lot of uh, time. Um, there's uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that can go into that, as any engineer can tell you. Um, my only one tip is uh, if you're starting with multi-threading and beams, stick with a fixed number of threads and go from there. Um, okay, so results. Uh, we started with 2,048 cores. We went down to 348 cores. Uh, our runtime initially was anywhere from four to six hours. We're now averaging anywhere from uh, one to 1.5 hours end to end, right? That's reading in the data, executing the query, executing all transformations and having the data land for analysts ready to read it. And of course, management loves when they get something for free, right? So um, I talked to you about how we find an efficient way to download the data and get onto the workers. Tyler now is going to talk to you about what we do with the data once it's on the workers. Thanks, Adam. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Tyler Flack. I'm a software engineer here at Blue Voyant. Uh, I'm gonna go over some analytics that we run and how we leverage Beam to help us save money and run fast. Wrong way. Cool, so um, as my colleagues have talked about, we've talked about how we can uh, efficiently, uh, quickly store all this data uh, and pull it out, intersect it with our footprints. Uh, but what do we do with it now that it's you know running through Beam now? Like, What, what can it tell us? Uh, so at Bluepoint, we have a wide variety of analytics, but uh, for now, I'm going to walk us through one in particular that deals with detecting potential vulnerabilities and potentially out-of-date software. Uh, at a high level, so big table, hundreds of millions of records coming through, you can just think of these as arbitrary string records for now. Uh, 
Now, the first step we have to do is enrich it. So we have to categorize this data. We have to extract uh, standardized uh, you know, identification about it. Uh, we use fingerprinting and regexes from our analyst curated data sets. Uh, it's very important that we have very up-to-date information, new vulnerabilities, new software definitions, because the cybersecurity landscape, as we know, is evolving every day. So after we enrich it, we have a little extra information about this uh, next analysis. So what does it actually tell us? So we know more about this record that came out, this observation on the internet, uh, but what does it mean? Do we care about it? Is this thing up to date? No vulnerabilities? Do we need to output that and pay for storage or have it affect downstream consumers? So first step, enrichment. Uh, you see an example here? Uh, this could be, pretend you have a large infrastructure that you're in charge of and you want to make sure, you know, you have a lot of teams, right? And all of your teams have different stacks and running whatever software they want to run on their VMs. Um, so your goal, I don't know, to detect whether they're running out of date software or vulnerabilities. So you port scan and here's an example of a record. Uh, you know, SSH, open SSH with a bunch of tokens and tags at the end. Uh, great, you know, looking at it, we see it. Oh, it looks like open SSH, but computers, like what, what is this thing? How can we classify it? So a typical solution, naive approach would be just plain Java regexes, but that's pretty slow, too slow for us. Uh, we could punt it out to BigQuery, do a cross-join regexes there. But again, every regex is going against every single you know, string uh, record in there, uh, n squared operations, a little too slow for us. But what we can do is compile all of our regexes into a hardware optimized regex database scanner uh, that fits on every worker that can allow us to quickly categorize and match records to classify it. So after we do that, for example, we now know the standardized attributes here. So we know that this type is OpenSSH. That's the name of the software here. The version is 7.4. And CPE, which if for those of you who don't know what it is, we'll get to in a little bit, um, we generate a CPE string. It's just a string for now. Uh, so the problem, there's a high amount of data overlap, right? So there's only a limited number of versions of OpenSSH out there. So, you know, if you have millions of the same string, why are you going to do CPU heavy processing and apply regex to all of them? Um, that's why you use group by key. Uh, simply enough, group by key by the text record, you only need to process it once and emit every record for other attributes with it. And in one of our examples, for this particular pipeline, we can go from 270 million to 6 million unique records that actually need to be matched. So we have a lot of time savings here. So I said I was going to mention, so CPEs, for those of you who don't know, it's a standardized way to classify hardware and software. Uh, the notation, as you can see, is some colons. CPE 2.3a A is application. There's operating system. There's hardware. But it's a way to standardize and classify uh, a piece of software uh, by name and version. So great, we have this. It's OpenSSH version 7.4. Here's the CPE. What does that tell us? Is it vulnerable? Is it out of date? Who knows? Uh, we could use side input queries for BigQuery, uh, like we mentioned before, running regexes in BigQuery, uh, not a fan of for our use cases. Uh, also, some of these rule sets for, for CPEs and CVEs. So NIST publishes uh, daily data, so all the CVEs that we know about, and sometimes complex rule sets that describe which CVEs apply and they can get kind of complex where you know, this particular CVE, which you can think of as a vulnerability. So this particular vulnerability uh, only applies if a given target is running Firefox 101 or 102, but at the same time, it needs to have Ubuntu 2004 and 2010. So you can imagine that when you have kind of infinite possibility of rules here, doing that in SQL is not very fun. Uh, so what we have come up with was uh, statically pre-building a bunch of maps, and we are able to load them uh, at runtime into our workers, and we can very quickly go from CPE to lists of CVEs. So we can go from, this is the software that they're running, and there are potentially 14 CVEs that apply to it. Um, so our, the pipeline is an hour, hour and a half to run, and you know, statically building these things on the fly and loading with memory, it takes a couple of minutes, but that is perfectly acceptable for how fast we can actually do the anal analysis. All right. so. We have the output, potentially 14 CVEs for this, you know, um, port that we scanned on a, a server. Uh, we also know, due to analyst um, curation, uh, the version 7.4 actually came out in 2016, uh, and there are many newer versions of this. Um, so you can imagine, 
you know, this particular use case, one CPE was generated and there's 14 CVEs. Uh, but what happens if there was a text record, you know, some other observation you saw that was, uh, you know, it looks like someone's running Firefox and uh, Windows XP. So that's one record, two CPEs, and since those are pretty old, and depending on the version of Firefox, hundreds of CVEs. Not too bad, but then you extrapolate that across the millions of times that you see these sort of observations, and you start looking at billions and billions of records of output. In this case, we're looking at like six terabytes, which isn't too bad, uh, compressed in BigQuery, but suppose you want to go back years and years and historically, on the fly, be able to pull this out. Uh, the costs add up, uh, which is why we go back to group by key again to normalize our data. Uh, here's an example of you know, arbitrary, you know, so the example we've been using, the output with the, the text record, the CPE and the CVE, and uh, it's not listed here, but you can imagine that there's, I mentioned there was 14 vulnerabilities for this guy, uh, 14 of these rows, uh, and all the data is duplicate except for the last column. Uh, so that's what it looks like in the Beam uh, workflow. What we can do is group by key, so we group by the record and the date, and we can output the normalized uh, smaller data sets. So the, the three that get broken out here, the middle one and the one on the right is what is gonna have the space savings really. So we have mappings of the arbitrary observations to the CPE, you know, the type of software it is. And then we also have the data set for this vulnerability applies to this CPE. Um, further using Beam uh, distinct with representative value do offend, so dedupe all that data, and it really boils down to 30 gigabytes. Um, so big cost savings there. Now, furthermore, now that we have these normalized data sets in BigQuery, uh, downstream consumers or analysts can now go query these individual, these data sets to answer questions like, on this day, what vulnerabilities applied to this particular CPE? Or, hey, I have, uh, you know, a port banner or something like, are there any CPEs that match that that we've done before just to save a lot of time? That was uh, one of the pipelines we have, like I said, with a bunch like this. Um, so before we had this implemented in Beam, uh, all of our pipelines were disparate, uh, different stacks, Python, Scripts, VMs, everywhere. So very complex to maintain. Uh, depending on how much data they're running um, and the resources available to them at the time, anywhere from one to 10 hours each. Uh, the big one is the cost of complexity uh, maintenance, code upkeep. Uh, but after moving all these pipelines into Beam, we have all of our data into one giant data lake. And we have one hour to process everything that used to take one to 10 split up. So we've saved money way faster, one code base, one architecture now. Um, it also allows for ad hoc analysis and quick turnaround for uh, analyst, you know, A-B testing. So if we have some new vulnerabilities that came out and we want to see how does that affect the system, hey, how much more output are we going to get now because this new vulnerability is out? We can quickly change some fingerprinting files, uh, quickly run one, uh, one pipeline, batch pipeline, and, you know, compare the outputs. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Alfredo with some closing thoughts. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, in this whole effort, we compiled a couple of questions. Um, we have uh, several more, as you can imagine. Um, but just a couple to throw out to the audience. Um, so a couple of things that we'd like to do is control bundle sizes. Uh, this is actually something that uh, Pablo talked about a little bit uh, in his talk just now. Um, there is something called group into batches. We tried it. It didn't work quite for us, and we think it's occurring a shuffle. Um, uh, also, Tucker mentioned this local group by uh, operation. There's nothing like that uh, as far as we know, and we had to kind of do things in our own way. Um, in general, this idea of operating within bundles, it seems like we're doing kind of an anti-pattern. Uh, so any more kind of insights into how bundles should be operated with or, or parameters for that would be interesting. Um, splittable do funds seem like they would handle a lot of the, the issues that we have with long tails um, to be able to say, you know, if one query is going to get back a million results and another query is going to get back just 10, uh, to be able to split out the results and batch onto those. Um, and finally, uh, we do, uh, we do uh, force a couple of fusion breaks via uh, reshuffle, via random key. Um, and this is the kind of thing we'd like to be able to control uh, a little bit more granular of way. Um, so just a couple of call outs uh, for all the Beam folks, um, some interesting conversations we can have at some point. Um, and with that, uh, I'll put up all contact informa information. Again, we are Blue Voyant. We're always looking for talented data engineers. This seems like a good place. Uh, so reach out to any one of us and happy to talk. So thank you.